So this workshop today is the use of theory and simulation. It's selecting a theory as a framework for simulation activities, which is a key to program success. In this session, we will discuss a broad range of theories as they apply to simulation. Certain specific aspects of simulation, such as tasks or skills training, debriefing, or team events. Others are more comprehensive and can be applied to most activities in simulation education. We'll discuss theories from different disciplines that the simulation list may consider in the development, implementation, facilitation, and debriefing of specific simulation activities and the broader use as a foundation for a simulation program. Others today are Gail Johnson and Carol Reed. Here's an associate professor of nursing at Metropolitan State University, a simulation educator with Health Partners Clinical Simulation. Here from the College of St. Catherine, an MS in nursing education from the University of Minnesota, and a PhD in nursing from the University of North Dakota. Her dissertation investigated the impact of clinical experiences and high fidelity simulation on clinical judgment. She is a side nurse educator through the NLN. The has presented at local, regional, national, and international conferences. She is recognized for her extensive experience designing developing curriculum and facilitating simulation-based education of practice areas. Other speaker today will be Gail Johnson, who is the Director for Health Partners Clinical Simulation and a current simulation program. Certified healthcare simulation educator and certified in simulation operations. Gail has a BSN from Graceland University, and instruction design and performance improvement from Boise State University and is a doctoral candidate at the University of North Dakota where she is investigating the effect of fidelity on nurse performance during simulation. Again, an invited presenter at regional, national, and international conferences and presented on a variety of simulation, education, and clinical topics. Before I actually have them start, I am going to share my desk that you can see where you can get to handouts. So if you go to healthforceminnesota.org and go to four educators and the college, university, and industry educators, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see simulation resources. We'll just click on find simulation resources. And you can either link it down below here or over to the left Login password. Word is simulation with a capital S. And let me put that in. And on this particular page, I ha we're having some problems with our website. So I put down the bottom the handout and also the link to the survey for your certificate of completion. You can also reach it by going over to the newsletters and webinars. So I would like to settle and uh, go ahead and get started. So there you go. Oh. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, to really quickly here go over Can everybody see the desktop? Good. Okay. So we've got two objectives for our presentation today. Um, we will identify theories to guide simulation work, and then we want to talk about um, applying a, theory, a theoretical framework to simulation design and facilitation. Okay. Not, okay. We're to advance the slides here. Okay. So what is a theory and why is it important? Uh, theories are frameworks in which the world view is created, where not absorbed, processes, um, processed, attained, and then that creates an understanding of um, kind of what's going on and makes it in a useful space um, for us. Theories in, are influenced by our beliefs, by the environment, 
experiences, and really they're the basis for our practice and the activities um, within our discipline. We use series to illuminate the darkness, if you are thinking the way I am, um, expand our vision in the world, to explain or challenge or overcome barriers, and provide us some direction for our work. Uh, these allow us to uh, explain the world, they inform reference our judgments, they bridge gaps in thinking. All times, they disrupt our thinking and, and really make us think about a new way, a new understanding of what's going on. Series signify different concepts to different people and they evoke different emotions. And I, I really think that um, for me, theories do evoke different emotions. Some I'm very comfortable with, some of them I'm less comfortable with, and that's really an interesting um, piece of this um, thinking about theories. We us use theories as part of our everyday work, and often we find that we hold or embrace uh, several worldviews or paradigms, and we prioritize those depending on the context or situation that we're in. Today, to consider a number of theories that will help challenge, validate, expand, and refine our approaches to simulation-based education. A show of hands, who uses theory as a framework for your simulation program? And if you want to just hit the raising button, it's up by your name under participants. Few people, a handful maybe, and those of you that are calling in, I don't know if that if you are able to do that um, as well. But so on question, so up your hands. The next question is, who uses theory for specific simulation activities? Is your hand. So we've got some each, six or so, six or seven for each of those questions. That's great. So that's that this is kind of an important topic for you to be learning about because the theoretical basis for your um, submission program is helpful. Use a theoretical framework in simulation. Can you put in the chat box, the, those of you that are using theoretical frameworks, what, what why you use a framework? Make your send to says everyone, because then we'll be able to. See See. Centers. Can you monitor that? We're not seeing anything on our end. Okay, some of the reasons that um, you might use a theoretical framework is what we just talked about, ma making that bridge between. Um, well, and what you're trying to do, it can be used as a guide for your teaching. It can share knowledge and help um, build understanding. Tonight's your your prom or your um, session activity um, really be a framework for your work. And two people that responded. Did you see those? No. Oh. Okay. Just yep. I see that one. And then also it will um, help guide processes, as you said, and guides debriefing and assists in continuity among faculty. That's a good one. Right, that everybody's kind of on the same page. Well, why, why is this discussion about theory important or in an important conversation to have? There's a couple reasons uh, we wanted to presentation. Certainly, uh, despite a growing body of simulation work, many studies and other publications don't identify a theory or a theoretical framework. Those that do 
have adopted theories from education, psychology, improvement science. There are some challenges when considering a theory or theoretical framework for your program or for simulation activities. Um, one is uh, sometimes people theory because they're familiar with it. They have a personal preference. Um, it might be something that they've, they've read about or that they've used in other activities like um, deliberate practice or reflective practice that we'll talk about more uh, come shortly. And so because someone is familiar with that, that's the theory that they're always going to use, whether or not it's the most applicable for a a circumstance or a setting. Likewise, sometimes people don't choose a theory because they have limited knowledge about it or about all of the different components and that theoretical framework or the theory could be utilized. Uh, another uh, uh, something, another thing to consider with uh, choosing a theory for either an activity or your entire simulation program um, might be uh, popularity. So we're talk about experiential learning, for example, that is one of the most prevalent theoretical frameworks or theories in simulation literature. Uh, just because it is doesn't mean that it might be the best one to use or the most applicable to everybody. And the last thing to think about is feasibility, including cost, time, things like that. Um, for example, deliberate practice, where we're repeating the activity over and over again with feedback each time with a desired effect to improve performance or even achieve mastery. Now, that might be appropriate for some programs or even some activities in a program like starting IVs, inserting a chest tube, intubation, but um, it may not be feasible for other kinds of simulation where, where we just don't have have the time, the um, uh, affordability, the instructors to rerun a simulation with a group of four or six or more participants over and over and over again until achieving mastery. So um, if we can, again, in the chat box, those of you who are utilizing uh, theories in your program, if you would just type in a, a theoretical framework or the theory that you're using, and we'll take just a couple, maybe five, 10 seconds for this. The one I've gotten is from Catrice, and it's a debriefing for meaningful learning. I'll cross that one on too. Great. One, deliberate practice, okay. experiential learning theory, Excellent. Okay. we'll be talking about some of those um, as we get through the presentation. There are a, a number of different theories that can be applied uh, and, and that have been in the literature. So we've identified, we've selected several. Uh, more learning or education based theory. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just several. And it doesn't, it does not include um, debriefing for meaningful learning or the Kirkpatrick models of evaluation, some of those. So um, they are some select theories that have been in the literature as well as a review book for people who are interested in the CHSE exam. Some of these are listed in there as well, which um, were the reasons that we chose these. Divided the theories that we're going to be talking about based on um, the, a paradigm of learning, so behaviorism versus cognitive versus constructivist, and then we'll also talk about a couple of simulation-specific theories. So just to kick things off a bit on um, behaviorism, uh, this is people remember Pavlov's dog, uh, the mouse and the cheese. So uh, participants receive a stimuli. And then, without any um, recognition or consideration for what's going on in the brain from a processing standpoint, it's just they get the stimuli, there's a response. And so um, it can be a positive response to reinforce, or it might be a negative response, which will still reinforce their, their outcomes. Now, does this apply to simulation? Well, there are a couple, certainly a couple things. 
in some respects, deliberate practice or just practicing over and over again specific skills, not um, some aspects of deliberate practice. But if we're just talking about skills and repetition and feedback to do something correctly, that could be uh, falling under behavioralism. The other important component is that whole piece of negative reinforcement. So if we have um, a participant that has uh, an emotional response to a simulation activity that's negative, those bad experiences can lead to fear and anxiety, and then that fear and anxiety is going to or could possibly continue on in future simulation experiences as well as clinical practice. Another, uh, another category is uh, cognitive learning theories. And so this is, you know, cognitive learning, uh, unlike our where really the learning tends to be more passive with reinforcement from an external source. Um, learning isn't necessarily a passive activity, and it really uh, occurs through mental processes and strategies. So the cognitive um, folks focus on what's going on in that black box inside the brain that we can't get a good glimpse of, but we know that there's different ways of processing information to get things in and out of long-term memory and then be able to pull it into working memory. So we're going to talk about a couple theories that can fall under this setting. The first is deliberate practice. So in some aspects, deliberate practice can live in behavioralism as well, um, but for more advanced activities, practicing mock codes, teamwork, those kinds of, of simulations where we have more advanced skills than just practicing um, tasky kinds of things. A deliberate practice can fall under cognitive theory as well. So what is it? Well, it's where we're practicing and practicing over and over again, getting feedback after each time with a very specific goal, either a participant goal, a set goal or the facilitator set goal to increase performance and improve performance. So our um, musicians, athletes, pilots, all of these professionals practice uh, uh, of hours to achieve mastery. And healthcare professionals, as we all know, um, really don't have that many hours in simulation or in other educational opportunities designed to improve practice. So, um, you look at them translating this to simulation. So with deliberate practice, we may have um, opportunities through skills to have participants practice a skill, get feedback, do it again, get, get feedback, and um, with the goal of achieving mastery. In fact, one simulation program in the country has this as their program theoretical framework, and most of their activities are um, deliberate practice to mastery. How it's not always um, possible if we, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, being at groups of students or a simulation scenario type of, of uh, experiences, we may not be able to repeat everything and correct those mistakes just because of um, time, resources, et cetera. Important cognitive theory is this idea of cognitive load. So Weller identified that um, learning and problem solving occur within the context of how information is processed. And it takes a lot of brain power to move things from long-term or short-term memory, working memory, into long-term memory. It also takes a lot of brain processing power to absorb and understand complex pieces of information. And sometimes, from a simulation standpoint, um, it may be that we design such a complex scenario for novice learners that our novice learners are using so much brain power to comprehend a lot of things that they can't now use that processing power to move things in and out of long-term memory, into working memory. It's the idea of lean art. If you're trying to set up a VCR or connect some piece of electronic equipment, it might be easier to process directions with line art than with a very realistic, complex photo. Along with that, as people become experts and they practice these uh, activities, instead of having to move individual piece of information back and forth, cognitive load theorists would suggest that 
um, experts in repetition, we tend to lump things into chunks, and it's easier to move those things back and faster. Like people manage a lot of cardiac arrests, um, don't think of one of those tasks in separation. They lump a lot of things together. Another type of cognitive is um, social learning theory. Uh, Bandura had suggested that people are really capable of not only learning by doing, but learning by observing other people perform a certain action and, and or exhibit a certain behavior. And so one of the ways that really we see this a lot in simulation is by um, you know, what we do with participants who are active in the classroom. They not be hands-on at the bedside, but they are still learning and, in fact, evaluation share that they found the, the, partic the participation from an observation standpoint and the debriefing discussion very valuable and sometimes more so than their hands-on. A is another uh, risk that uh, has applicability with the world of simulation. So we would stipulate that there are several type of learning conditions depending on um, whether someone is learning verbal information, intellectual skills, cognitive strategies, tasky kinds of things with motor skills, and that um, utilizing these nine different conditions, uh, these nine different activities, uh, tailoring them for the specific condition of learning will maximize that. So he would suggest that it's important to gain attention of the participants, inform people of the objectives, um, stimulating recall of prior knowledge, then we give them the stimulus or the simulation experience and providing feedback, et cetera. So a lot of these nine is are things that we do when we're pre-briefing, orienting people to the sim, conducting the sim, and providing feedback during the debriefing, if possible, then allowing the opportunity to repeat. So moving on, um, we're going to talk a little bit about skill acquisition and some of the other um, theories. These fall, the skill acquisition um, does fall under the cognitive uh, uh, And it starts out with a um, perception of the situation and the need to modify the perception of the situation. And typically what happens with skill acquisition is that there's this paradigm shift and change in the role or what the person um, experiences. So that explicit knowledge stays as um, very conscious declarative knowledge and moves to um, implicit knowledge that's more intuitive um, and procedural and they work together. The list um, occurs in a variety of areas. The skills can show um, real similarity and development from their initial knowledge to a much more fluent, um, spontaneous, effless behavior, and I think of skills um, in the nursing realm of things like catheterization. When a student is first learning to catheterize, they're so focused on the steps, and um, if a mistake, they have to start over from the beginning again and repeat from the start what they're doing. They can't really even talk to the patient while they're acquiring this skill. And as they get to that intuitive and implicit knowledge um, where it's much more fluid and spontaneous, they begin to be able to manage um, patient variations with the catheterization. They are able to talk to the patient. Um, that shift has taken place and that the perception of the situation is a little bit different. Um, based her um, on the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, and she talks about it in a more holistic manner, that it's more than psychomotor skills. It refers to the skill, the skill of nursing in an actual clinical setting. And as we all, um, or, or many of us, maybe not all, many of us are aware, goes from the novice to the expert. And we talked about a little bit with the cognitive load theory. You move from the novice, um, just on this very specific situational um, and, and Moving to that more proficient and expert level, where they have, um, they're able to prioritize 
there's a change in the learner's perception of the demands of the situation. Um, there seem lots of equal parts. Um, the novice, everything's important, and they have a really hard time filtering out what's most important and what's least important. And when you go in to do your um, full assessment, you do your full assessment, and never mind that they're having trouble breathing. I still have to check those, um, you know, their nail beds to make sure they blanch and refill. Um, to that, that more competent, proficient um, nurse who is able to recognize things immediately and prioritize and not take the pieces apart as individual pieces, but rather um, see the elements of the situation as a whole. And they're very engaged in the um, in the situation. So in station, if we're working on that, we, we have to level our um, expectations of the students and perhaps even the amount of information that you present in a simulation to what the level is of the student. So if you've got novices, you're not going to put in um, a lot of information do that cognitive overload, uh, but rather put in kind of the only few things going wrong at a time and then work your way up to the more proficient or expert um, level. Constructivism talks about experiences, knowledge, and ideas that are already present in the individual and how um, people construct their own understanding and knowledge um, of the world from those experiences and they create new meaning when new experiences and new information is added. So with constructivism, there's something new that comes along. The individual has to reconcile it with their previous knowledge and ideas. Um, may cause them to change their beliefs, or perhaps they discard the new information as irrelevant to get to this new meaning. It's um, individuals are active creators of their own knowledge questions, they explore, they assess what um, they know, and then they reflect and talk about it, how their understanding has changed as a result. So in simulation, we have that um, new information that we introduce in the simulation, allow them to explore how that new information um, is coming at them, what it means with, their, with the information that already exists, and then in the debriefing process, we reflect on um, what happened? How did the student learn? Um, what uh, understandings do they have and how has their learning changed? Um, another graphic is that they have what they know from the past and it swirls up to what they're learning in the present and makes its way up to how to use this in the future. So they're building, um, every moment is building new meaning and new information and a new way of knowing things. Learning theory, um, Knowles is adult learning theory is also called andro andro androgy as opposed to pedagogy. Um, learner characteristics are such that um, they're self directed, they are autonomous, they have accumulated um, a reservoir of experience that becomes their resource for learning. They have tremendous and varied life experiences that they are trying to connect to their new learning and build from. Extremely strong readiness to learn. Um, it's linked to their developmental tasks. As adults, they learn. Uh, they often have a problem-centered approach or a um, connection application. They want to learn to be able to solve some problem, um, to be able to master some situation. The internal motivation and recognize the value of learning. They need to know when something. Um, must be learned, and their participation is actually linked to some sort of responsibility or role. So the reason that they are participating has to do with oftentimes their job, um, a goal for jobs, something to do with their family member or, you know, their responsibility as a family member. Um, so there are a couple critiques to the adult learning theory, one of which is that it assumes that all adults uh, learn the same, and we know that that's not necessarily true. Um, and it also doesn't fully consider the effects of culture on learning and development, and um, some of us are seeing that a little bit more in our uh, educational experiences than perhaps we have um, in the past. And adult learning theory is really kind of situation specific and, and can actually be applied to non-adults. So teens and um, kids have some of this 
um, self-directed autonomous um, learning desire as, as well. Tanner's clinical judgment model is a specific nursing theory, and um, Tanner talks about four stages, noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting. And, and the first part of noticing is that perceptual gasp of the situation, grasp of that situation at hand. Um, it moves to interpreting where they develop sufficient understanding of the situation um, and are able to respond, so that ability to pull what their context is, what the background is, kind of what their relationship is with the individual, what their expectations are, um, that all together into a bundle as they move on to interpreting and figuring out the um, reasoning patterns using some analysis, their intuition, um, and, and how they're talking with the client in a narrative, to deciding on the course of action and um, deeming what is the most appropriate action, whether it's not responding or responding. And that tending to the patient's response to those actions is the reflection in action. So how, at the time that the interventions are taking place or the actions that the nurse is doing um, are occurring, also kind of an observation and a reflection of is this working? Are things getting better? And um, after, afterwards, the outcomes have um, uh, been seen, the outcomes of the actions, then there's another review focusing on the appropriateness, appropriateness of all of the aspects of the Situation and action on action, and that really leads to clinical learning, and that learning um, adds to that knowledge and background um, that's used in the noticing for the next situation. So it's quite cyclical. A number of the theories that we've talked about today um, about reflection and shown um, you, uh, about reflective practice. And educators are called to develop as reflective um, practitioners. One of the ways that we use this the most, I think, is in debriefing. Students or the participants reflect on their actions within a um, particular simulation. It's important um, for us to all reflect those processes are come from experience and considering and um, evaluating our previous knowledge in light of those new experiences and incorporating the new knowledge to inform our future um, practice. The practice um, is an in-depth consideration of the events of the situation, what worked, what happened, um, what were your thoughts, what were your feelings, uh, why, who, when, what questions. And we need to get it from as many angles as possible. It's a very holistic theory. Um, Specific processes um, allow us to have some awareness where it involves cognitive processes, um, that strong critical element of what is um, going on, analysis and appraisal, reviewing and reconstructing um, to determine the aims um, and how that's improving our practice. Um, so discussion about self-awareness and about self-development and how um, emotional involvement was. And all of that comes together to um, develop new information and new ways of um, responding to situations. So the next constructivist theory that we're going to be reviewing is experiential learning by Kolb. And if you notice on the slide, it also includes a reflective com component or reflective observation. What is one of the most, most or at least cited in the literature um, these in simulation? In fact, uh, John Schaefer and his colleagues reviewed 221 sim studies, and of the ones that identified an educational theory, 20% did use Kolb's experiential learning. And so this is a process of um, learning from real life experiences. It focuses on the individual's learning process. The purpose of experiential learning is to learn from uh, learn from mistakes, consequences, as well as the achievements. It's a good fit with simulation uh, because it 
is practiced experience. If you think about SIM, we're practicing hands-on, um, actively experimenting in a, a controlled situation. And hopefully, we're building those experiences on authentic, real-life situations. So if you know, one of the, the ways of looking at experiential learning or applying this to SIM is do we allow participants to make mistakes and the scenario plays out the way that it would, we can come together and talk about it, that's one application of experiential learning. So we have the concrete experience, um, actively experimenting, reflecting on these observations. Anger are, are credited with situated learning. So situa situated learning in contrast with traditional classroom learning activities that may involve abstract knowledge, uh, that which may, may not be in context, um, Lay argues that learning is situated or contextual and, and people learn where activities normally occur. Learning is embedded with activity, uh, with context, with culture, and oftentimes on, on the floor or in simulation can be unintentional as well as deliberate. So think about application to simulation. You know, this again highlights some of the importance of um, creating those authentic and realistic um, Consider different, you know, fidelity and realism as our, our um, participants are experiencing that activity. People also learn from another context standpoint in communities of practice, and this is taken from um, the work that we talked about earlier with Bruner, uh, the social cognition or social learning theory, where that was really focused on observation and as learners start in the periphery, if you think about how new staff are assimilated into a clinical environment, or even new, um, um, learn if you have a interprofessional team or a team with in simulation with different levels of learners, sometimes the more novice people are standing on the periphery and observing and watching while the more experienced colleagues take over, and gradually those novice learners will increase their participation as they um, have a little bit more experience. All similar to Lave and Wenger's work and um, Bruner's is uh, Vygotsky's scaffolding theory. Scaffolding is the support given during the learning process. It might be um, simulation world, it could be cues, it could be prompts by the um, facilitator. It may even be active teaching during the sim by the facilitator if that is the model that the program is using. Uh, whether the scenario is stopped or the um, facilitator participates in a role that would normally be in that clinical environment. So it's a way to expertly provide some expert assistance for really novice learners. And the theory, the, the theory behind this is um, participants will learn more if we can provide them with scaffolding, i.e. support while they're learning. And so from a simulation standpoint, as as we think about structuring our scenarios and building in those triggers, um, it's important to consider that novice learners are going to need additional help, but as people learn their skills and knowledge, it would be really appropriate following this model to withdraw those cues and not provide all of the facilitator assistance that might do for novice, our novice learners. We're going to close our discuss a theoretical discussion with two simulation-specific theories. Um, the first may be really familiar to many people on this uh, conference call or webinar, and that's the NLN Jeffrey simulation framework. That was originally designed in the 2005 and updated in 2012, where um, 2012 revision has uh, several constructs. So simulation design characteristics will impact outcomes. Now originally in 2012, Jeffries identified the only participant focused outcome. So um, simulation will impact or could impact knowledge, 
skill performance, learner satisfaction, critical thinking, self-confidence. And the way the scenario or the simulation experience is designed, the characteristics of that, including debriefing, realism or fidelity, um, the amount of um, support or cues, I talked about scaffolding, uh, or even problem solving, how difficult the scenario is, how much problem solving, cognitive load um, is required, will impact the outcome. Outcomes. And there are also aspects that will impact both the design as well as outcomes, facilitators, knowledge, skill, participant, and educational practices. In 2016, however, um, the model has been reformatted, similar concepts, but just a little bit different format. And so what the, uh, now, if we look at this whole screen as context, and so um, the, the simulation experience set in context, so the context, whether it's an academic setting, um, in situ simulation, uh, health system sim, where participant is in the OR, all those impact every aspect of the sim simulation. And then within that context, we can look at background um, design, the simulation experiences, and outcomes. So around are things like uh, goals, um, the resources that are available. So what kind of stuff do you have? What about people? Uh, do you have, are you the only person running the scenario, or do you have multiple people? Do you need multiple people? How, how does that simulation experience fit into a larger curricula, whether it's part of a, a school or an orientation process or something completely different? The design are specific elements, so the scenario content, how the scenario flows, those things that we talked about with the simulation design aspects on the previous slide, fidelity, are you using video, um, what cues are being provided or support. And there's that simulation experience, so the background feeds into the design, feeds into the simulation experience, where there's a dynamic interaction between the facilitator and the participant their skills, their educational techniques using, uh, that they're using, um, the prep that they've made for the simulation activity, all of that really impacts the participant. And some of the literature suggests that participant age, um, their, even their gender, their self-confidence, anxiety, where they are in their career, those kinds of things will also impact the simulation experience. All of these, uh, in order to have an effective sim experience, it should be experiential, it should be interactive and collaborative, needs to be participant, um, Ellen Jeffries uses the word learner, but it needs to be participant-centered, and all built, of course, on an environment of trust. I think one of the most exciting uh, changes that I've noticed in this theory is the outcomes piece. So the original work really focused on participant outcomes, and Jeffries suggested that, you know, that wasn't, uh, while it was focused on initially participant, that certainly wasn't the um, only outcomes, and this new framework has to optimize that, if you will. So uh, there's certainly participant outcomes, but also uh, patient outcomes, improved patient safety, systems improvement that can be part of simulation as well. The yeah. um, simulation-specific framework or theory is Khalili's Clinical Simulation Practice Framework. We developed that um, experiential educational tool to assist students to integrate and apply theoretical knowledge and skills with critical thinking, clinical judgment, um, prioritization, problem-solving, decision-making, and teamwork skills. It involves three dimensions, the learning environment, the scenarios, and the simulation practice to develop that competent, confident, collaborative, professional student in the real practice setting. The key strategies um, associated with this are um, to have a safe, positive, reflective, and fun simulation learning um, environment where the students can make mistakes, with the consequences of putting a real human life in jeopardy. So that the students' anxieties and stress, encourage them to um, participate, to reflect on their thoughts and their ideas. I believe that that, um, that uh, getting rid of that anxiety and that stress during the performance really opened up the students to 
um, their learning and to sharing more so that others could learn as well. He believed that debriefing engaged the students in self-reflection and discovery and it encouraged critical reflection before and on action facilitating confidence and helping the students identify their learning needs. The educator role uh, is really to facilitate the learning and say against errors of condition. So meaning um, that there is nothing that, w that would be unrealistic occurring in the uh, simulation and making sure that processes and procedures um, be transferred to real life situations. Uh, um, some challenging was that um, was in a realistic environment, and then finding ways to challenge and integrate the simulation so that it really replicate the reality of the workplace, the true world. And that fidelity piece was um, was challenging. Um, the point that I made earlier, allowing the students. Um, Growth and professional role and competence to increase was important and to um, give them the opportunity to face decisions and consequences of their actions within the simulation um, scenario. Um, make interactive and inclusive so that um, the students would be actively participating and then creating that inter professional um, simulation was important as well to improve communication techniques, um, holistic care, collaborative practice, and that whole piece of clinical judgment and critical thinking and responding appropriately. So as we uh, look wrapping up this discussion, certainly the theories that we have presented as I mentioned in the beginning, the only theoretical frameworks and theories applicable to SIM. We've heard colleagues on the call have identified some that we did not cover, including um, DL. There certainly are some implications of learning theories for simulation. So from the behavior, behavioristic or behaviorism standpoint, uh, think about deliberate practice and what are we doing to help our participants develop mastery if it is applicable? But also being cognizant of what kind of reinforcement are we providing people having a negative experience in SIM and carrying that forward? Or are we uh, providing positive reinforcement, even something as simple as clapping or acknowledging a job well done during the scenario or other kinds of simulation activities? From a cognitive standpoint, being aware of the impact that cognitive load may have, and as we uh, are looking at novice learners, the continuum from novice to experts, our simulation scenarios and simulation activities with the appropriate level in mind. Being uh, the bent of our participants in to committees of practice, whether it's within that simulation cohort that they're working with or others in the organization, and uh, recognizing and acknowledging that people learn from observation, from observing others participating in SIM, and also reflecting on their observations if they are watching themselves during a video-assisted degree. Of course, with our constructivists, that whole piece of active learning and making their own meaning from uh, experiences and uh, rectifying their new, this new knowledge or new information with previous learnings, uh, reflecting on their practice, on their actions, and applying the new principles in different situations going forward. From simulation specific, many, many of us have thought about simulation uh, or theories for specific components of SIM. We debrief how we design scenarios. I think, um, one of the exciting pieces is to look at theoretical frameworks that can encompass all aspects of what we do and developing a process for identifying um, uh, within 
a theoretical framework, why we take the actions that we take, whether it's with a specific simulation theory or some of these others linked together. So we have just a five minutes left. So I'm going to talk just really briefly on how to, you know, kind of the ideas for choosing a theory for your simulation program. Um, oftentimes we think of the single three approach, um, one theory that resonates with you or with your group of faculty or it's the program theory. Um, that's what you feel is the, the, is the um, one way to go. A multi-theory approach might incorporate aspects from different theories to create your own. Perhaps you choose different theories depending on the situation, the participants, the type of simulation you're doing, the level of the participants' uh, education. Um, so there's a, a number of different approaches to um, choosing a theory for your simulation program. There are advantages and disadvantages of using a single theory versus several, and, and um, some of the comments that were made earlier um, indicate that you've thought about that a little bit. Overarching themes, what's supportive of the, the um, outcomes that you're looking for? Um, the, the items that you need to think about is, does your theory support that reflection and reflective practice? Because that is um, key to learning and moving forward with learning. Um, make sure that you're using that safe environment. Um, there's, the safe isn't always the, the word that people want to use, but to make it so it's not threatening or um, the, the learning isn't, uh, not the learning, the participants aren't concerned that what is happening is going to go elsewhere. It has to stay. Kind of that what happens in SIM stays in SIM sort of aspect of it. Um, the active, active part is really important. Um, and the piece about um, creating new knowledge and understanding. Now, one thing to point out is that if you're using your simulation as an evaluative, like a, a summative, I mean, sorry, a summative evaluation as opposed to a formative evaluation, it does have risks. The participants need to know that participating in this simulation and the activities that you, um, or the actions that you take are going to be evaluated and you're, you know, passing or not passing, determine whether you pass or don't pass the course, or whether you keep your job or don't keep your job, or um, those piece of it. So th that information needs to be shared with the um, participants very clearly so they understand um, part of the, the part, part of the simulation. That's all we have to say. Okay. Any questions? I see Sue posted. If you have questions, to, um, post them in the chat. Sue, are there any questions for us? Yes, yeah, I have a question for you. Which theory do you do each of you use or do you use a combination of them? And how do you actually um happen? I mean if you pick a theory, how do you actually um as a part of your program? Sure, this is Gail. I will answer that first. So our overarching program framework is the NLM Jeffries model, or Jeffries theoretical framework. And we have incorporated that, so as we're designing scenarios and simulation activities, we look at um, the design characteristics, we look at who our participants are, um, knowing that those two things are going to, as well as some of the other constructs, will impact the outcomes. Uh, as far as how we have operationalized that, that's part of our ongoing Boarding and orientation for uh, new education faculty. We it's incorporated into our policies and um, how we structure our scenarios uh, utilizes some of those pieces as well. So at Ohio State, we don't have a strong simulation program, but we do use simulation in several of our courses. So we tend to use um, reflective practice a lot. We require reflection from our students. Um, and our participants in simulation, oftentimes a written um, reflection, but we also use that in the debriefing with the, um, you know, having them share their learning, you know, went well, what would they like to change? Um, participants talk first, those, those kinds of aspects. I personally like Tanner's model. I think it 
um, flows well for nursing, and as a nurse educator, that um, that resonates well with me. And I did do quite a bit of um, investigating uh, as part of my doctoral dissertation. So it's not kind of coming to me as um, just because a nursing one I like the best, but but it that really resonates with me as a as a way um, to help students move from that novice. Expert um, role, so maybe a little bit of Ben or two. And and I think like many educators, we also look at different series for maybe some specific activities or components of the sim. Um, we have a great interest in cognitive load and not having you know too much stuff put in a simulation, so our participants aren't going to be successful. And some of those things are components that we can share rationale for why we make decisions, whether it's a formally documented um, theory in a policy or ver just why we're making the decisions we are about how the scenario is structured, made how we incorporate some of these other theories. Right. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any right now. Could you perhaps um, flip through the rest of your PowerPoint? Because I would like to show them what else you've got in there for your sure. references and such. Oh, green here. Oh, here's our references. If anybody has questions, um, feel free to give us a pop us an email or let us know. information. And one other at the very end. Oh, you don't have it on that, that one. Okay. Um, just, uh, I wanted to just really thank you both, Carol and Gail, for your time today. Very, very useful information. Uh, I do to mention that the framework that Gail is using Jeffries model, the NLN Jeffries model. Dr. Jeffries will be our keynote speaker for our conference in on May 17th and 18th. And please do not hesitate to email me if you've got questions on that. If to the healthforceminnesota.org website, you will find the PowerPoint from today and you will also find the link that will to the survey so that you can get a um, certificate for completion for today. And that, I just want to thank you all. And this is rec being recorded. So if you have somebody that would like to listen to it, it will be up on our Health Force Minnesota website. Please appreciate your time and your willingness to share with us. Thanks for having us.